Hello everyone, my name is Stephanie Streimel and I'm the Infectious Diseases Clinical Pharmacy Specialist and Antimicrobial Stewardship Pharmacist at Memorial Hermann Memorial City Medical Center. In this presentation, I will be reviewing the data for the use of vitamin D, specifically for its use for SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 as part of the Society of Infectious Diseases Pharmacist COVID-19 Resources. In addition to vitamin D's classic roles on calcium and bone homeostasis, it also plays an important role in the immune system. Vitamin D's initial form is inactive. However, through hydroxylation in the liver, it is converted to vitamin D3 and then further converted and activated in the kidneys. This active form has many effects in the immune system pathways, and those include inhibition of B cell proliferation, blocking B cell differentiation and immunoglobulin secretion, suppressing T cell proliferation, which leads to decreased inflammatory cytokine production, as well as increased production of anti-inflammatory cytokines, inhibition of monocyte production of inflammatory cytokines, and inhibition of dendritic cell differentiation and maturation, resulting in preservation of an immature phenotype. As in the last slide, appropriate vitamin D levels decrease inflammatory cytokines. And with the speculation that COVID-19 patients may have increased possibility of a cytokine storm, there is speculation that supplementation with vitamin D in those that are deficient may assist in preventing this process. Additionally, defense against uncontrolled inflammation and viral infections in general is provided via T regulatory lymphocytes through their ability to suppress many immune responses. Specifically shown here in the blue box is the proposed pathway in which COVID-19 patients may benefit from increase of these T regulatory lymphocytes, which are noted to be lower in this population and can be increased with vitamin D supplementation. Furthermore, vitamin D is also thought to produce protective effects evolved in the coagulation pathway. The recommended daily intake differs based on age, with additional differences for those women that are pregnant or lactating. For adults, the recommended vitamin D daily dose is 600 international units until age 70 when it increases to 800 international units at greater than 70 years of age. Vitamin D is relatively safe with high upper intake levels. It has been shown that adults can tolerate up to 4,000 international units of vitamin D daily before experiencing adverse effects. Long-term adverse effects may include nonspecific symptoms such as anorexia, weight loss, polyuria, and heart arrhythmias. More serious toxic effects can result in increased vitamin D levels leading to vascular and tissue calcification that subsequently results in damage to the heart, blood vessels, and kidneys. Of note, serum 25 hydroxy D is the best indicator of vitamin D status, and it is noted that serum 25 hydroxy D levels above approximately 125 to 150 nanomoles per liter should be avoided. There is an association of serum levels roughly around 75 to 120 nanomoles having increase in all-cause mortality, as well as greater risk of car cancer and cardiovascular effects, and more falls and fractures amongst the elderly. Vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin naturally present in very few foods. It's namely found in fatty fish like salmon, tuna, and mackerel, but small amounts are also found in beef liver, cheese, and egg yolks. However, most sources in the American diet come from fortified foods such as milk, breakfast cereals, along with some orange juice, yogurt, and margarine products. Those deficient in vitamin D are often recommended to obtain it through required dietary supplements because food sources and UV sunlight rays alone are often not enough for supplementation. The question does arise on how much of a role vitamin D and sunlight play in this viral infection. A literature search relating to sunlight and vitamin D status, specifically for older adults, was performed and the two papers referenced here were of interest. In the first paper by Laird and colleagues, countries in Europe were selected by their severity of infection, high versus low, and were limited to national surveys or, where national surveys not available, to geographic areas within the country affected by infection. 
Laird and colleagues selected papers from 1999 onwards, which correlated with most measurements when they were available in Europe, for adults specifically. Also, COVID-19 infection and mortality data was gathered from the World Health Organization. For Scotland, though, data was sourced from Public Health England and the National Records Office, Scotland. Observations were made that mortality, when plotted against latitude, revealed that countries lying below 35 degrees north latitude had relatively low mortality. However, above 35 degrees north latitude, populations generally receive sufficient sunlight, so retention of that adequate vitamin D store and serum concentration during the winter likely actually resulted in vitamin D deficiency. Spain and northern Italy, which are located at these lower latitudes, do have high rates of vitamin D deficiency and higher COVID-19 mortality rates. Exceptions were also found with those such as Norway, Sweden, and Finland. However, they have documented use of vitamin D supplementation and fortification of their foods. Thus, the authors concluded that circumstantial and experimental evidence suggests vitamin D may play a supportive role of the immune system, particularly in regulating cytokine response. Mohammed and colleagues in an additional publication on the role of vitamin D discussed the possible antithrombotic events. Specifically, they performed a prospective study on a cohort comprising of 40,000 women drawn from southern Swedish population and found that following them for a mean period of 11 years, the study concluded with a habit of more active sun exposure, women were at a 30% lower risk of VTE than those who did not have a habit of having more active sun exposure. This supportive role of vitamin D in levels has been studied for quite some time in general. With another metal analysis by Martineau and colleagues. They performed this systematic review meta analysis of such supplementation specifically for the prevention of acute respiratory tract infections. They performed searches of Medline Embase, the Cochrane Central Register of Controlled Trials, Web of Science, clinicaltrials.gov, and the International Standard Randomized Control Trials Number Registry from inception to December 2015. 25 eyed trials were included with the criteria that they were randomized, double line, placebo controlled trials of supplementation with vitamin D3 or vitamin D2 of any duration, and those were the included had also to be approved by a research ethics committee, and if data was on incidence of acute respiratory tract infection, it had to be collected prospectively and pre-specified as an efficacy outcome. This resulted in a total of 11,321 participants aging from 0 to 95 years of age. The authors concluded that vitamin D supplementation was safe and it protected against acute respiratory tract infection overall. Patients who were vitam very vitamin D deficient and those not receiving bolus experienced the most benefit. Although it was seen that there was significant heterogeneity amongst trials included at 0.88 with a 95% confidence interval ranging from 0.81 to 0.96 and a p-value less than 0.05 for heterogeneity. In a subgroup analysis, protective effects were seen in those receiving daily or weekly vitamin D without additional boluses with statistical significance. More recently, Martineau and colleagues aim to examine and include additional data since their prior publication. This included three studies specifically published during 2020, shown here in the green box. However, none were di a direct assessment on vitamin D supplementation as related to COVID-19. The first paper by Gamma and colleagues reviewed vitamin D supplementation and prevention of tuberculosis infections and diseases. The next study by Mandelik and colleagues reviewed occurrence of infections in school children subsequent to supplementation with vitamin D, calcium, or zinc, and it was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Finally, the last study by Rake and colleagues assessed high-dose oral vitamin D supplementation and mortality in people aged 65 to 84 years. And this was a VIDAL cluster feasibility randomized control of open versus double blind individual randomization. 
None of these studies showed statistical significance as displayed in the forest plot here, and thus the question remains on the use of vitamin D supplementation specifically for COVID-19. Other studies relating to COVID-19 and vitamin D supplementation that were not randomized controlled trials and of varying levels of quality have been published this year. However, limitations should be considered when reviewing those conclusions. I have not included them here due to the parameters just discussed. When referencing clinical trials looking for specifically COVID-19 and vitamin D, four trials have been completed. The first trial shown here was the evaluation of the relationship between zinc, vitamin D, and B12 levels in the COVID-19 positive pregnant women. The second trial, which is the most applicable, was assessing COVID-19 and vitamin D in nursing home patients. And then as you can see, the third and fourth trial were not specifically assessing vitamin D as related to COVID-19. Note, there are 18 trials currently recruiting with several more directly focused on vitamin D and COVID-19, and it will be interesting to see what results are reported. We also want to remember any specific drug interactions that may occur due to the use of vitamin D as an adjunct medication in these trials. Interactions shown here include vitamin D with steroids, which results in a decreased metabolism of vitamin D. More notable drugs that may be used in hospitalized patients, such as clostermine, phenobarbital, and venetoin, also have drug-drug interactions with vitamin D. Cholesteramine results in decreased vitamin D absorption, and both phenobarbital and phenytoin result in increased vitamin D metabolism to inactive compounds. When further considering metabolism or absorption, another area for consideration are special populations, such as obese patients, those with dark skin, and those who may have had limited sun exposure, because all groups ultimately have lower levels of vitamin D and may need larger than normal doses to obtain appropriate levels. Ideal vitamin D levels are shown here in the third row. As discussed previously, in general, vitamin D supplementation is safe However, above these levels, you can have long-term adverse side effects. Currently, there's very few guideline recommendations regarding the use of supplemental vitamin D. The National Institute of Health found that there was insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of supplementation. However, with the National Institute for Health and Care Excellence, specifically in their guideline for COVID-19, they did not make a stance or a mention, but, Based off a revised statement of the COVID-19 outbreak, they did recommend adherence to daily vitamin D levels at 400 international units for supplementation specifically in adults. Specifically, this recommendation came from the statement that currently there are no results for randomized control trials to conclusively prove that vitamin D is beneficially effective in COVID-19 outcomes, but there is strong circumstantial evidence of association between vitamin D and the severity of COVID-19 responses, including death. Also, vitamin D deficiency correlates with hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and ethnicity, which are all features associated with increased risk of severe COVID-19. In summary, data may support vitamin D supplementation for acute respiratory infections. However, from the meta-analysis evaluated, a specific regimen has not been clearly defined. Also, data is lacking in regards to vitamin D supplementation for those with SARS-CoV-2, with only one completed trial evaluating COVID-19 and vitamin D, specifically in nursing home patients, and the results have not yet been published. Furthermore, the 18 trials that are currently recruiting will be interesting to see once results are published, but currently no guidelines provide recommendation for or against the use of supplemental vitamin D. This concludes the review of pertinent drug information for vitamin D as related to patients with SARS-CoV-2.